Wednesday, 14th of June, 1944. Dear Kitty, My head is haunted by so many wishes and thoughts, accusations and reproaches. I'm really not as conceited as so many people seem to think. I know my own faults and shortcomings better than anyone, but the difference is that I also know that I want to improve, shall improve, and have already improved a great deal. Why is it then, I so often ask myself, that everyone still thinks I'm so terribly knowing and forward? Am I so knowing? Is it that I really am, or that maybe the others aren't? That sounds queer, I realize now, but I shan't cross out the last sentence, because it really isn't so crazy. Everyone knows that Mrs. Van Dan, one of my chief accusers, is unintelligent. I might as well put it plainly and say stupid. Stupid people usually can't take it if others do better than they do. Mrs. Van Dan thinks I'm stupid because I'm not quite so lacking in intelligence as she is. She thinks I'm forward because she's even more so. She thinks my dresses are too short because hers are even shorter. And that's also the reason that she thinks I'm knowing because she's twice as bad about joining in over subject, subjects she knows absolutely nothing about. But one of my favorite sayings is, there's no smoke without fire, and I readily admit that I'm knowing. Now, the trying part about me is that I criticize and scold myself far more than anyone else does. Then, if Mummy adds her bit of advice, the pile of sermons becomes so insurmountable that in my despair I become rude and start contradicting, and then, of course, the old well-known Anne watchword comes back. No one understands me. This phrase sticks in my mind. I know it sounds silly, yet there is some truth in it. I often accuse myself to such an extent that I simply long for a word of comfort, for someone who could give me sound advice and also draw out some of my real self. But alas, I keep on looking, but I haven't found anyone yet. I know that you'll immediately think of Peter, won't you, Kit? It's like this. Peter loves me, not as a lover, but as a friend, and grows more affectionate every day. But what is the mysterious something that holds us back? I don't understand it myself. Sometimes I think that my terrible longing for him was exaggerated. Yet that's really not it, because if I don't go up to see him for two days, then I long for him more desperately than ever before. Peter is good, and he's a darling. But still, there's no denying that there's a lot about him that disappoints me, especially his dislike of religion and all his talk about food and various other things don't appeal to me. Yet I feel quite convinced that we shall never quarrel now that we've made that straightforward agreement together. Peter is a peace-loving person. He's tolerant and gives in very easily. He lets me say a lot of things to him that he would never accept from his mother. He tries mo most persistently to keep his things in order. And yet, why should he keep his innermost self to himself, and why am I never allowed there? By nature, he is more closed up than I am, I agree, but I know, and from my own experience, that at some time or other, even the most uncommunicative people long just as much, if not more, to find someone in whom they can confide. Both Peter and I have spent our most meditative years in the secret annex. We often discuss the future, the past, and the present, but, as I've already said, I still seem to miss the real thing, and yet I know that it's there. Yours, Anne. Thursday, 15th of June, 1944. Dear Kitty, I wonder if it's because I haven't been able to poke my nose outdoors for so long that I've grown so crazy about everything to do with nature. I can perfectly well remember that there was a time when a deep blue sky, the song of the birds, Moonlight and flowers could never have kept me spellbound. That's changed since I've been here. At Whitsun, for instance, when it was so warm, I stayed awake on purpose until half past eleven one evening in order to have a good look at the moon for once by myself. Alas, the sacrifice was all in vain, as the moon gave far too much light and I didn't dare risk opening a window. Another time, some months ago now, I happened to be upstairs one evening when the window was open. I didn't go downstairs until the window had to be shut. The dark rainy evening, the gale, the scuttling clouds held me entirely in their power. It was the first time in a year and a half that I'd seen the night face to face. 
After that evening, my longing to see it again was greater than my fear of burglars, rats, and raids on the house. I went downstairs all by myself and looked out through the windows in the kitchen and the private office. A lot of people are fond of nature. Many sleep outdoors occasionally. And people in prisons and hospitals long for the day when they will be free to enjoy the beauties of nature. But few are so shut away and isolated from that which can be shared alike by rich and poor. It's not imagination on my part when I say that to look up at the sky, the clouds, the moon, and the stars makes me calm and patient. It's a better medicine than either valerian or bromine. Mother Nature makes me humble and prepared to face every blow courageously. Alas, it has had to be that I am only able, except on a few rare occasions, to look at nature through dirty net curtains hanging before very dusty windows. And it is no pleasure looking through these any longer because nature is just the one thing that really must be unadulterated. Yours, Anne. Friday, 16th of June, 1944. Dear Kitty, New problems. Mrs. Van Dan is desperate, talks about a bullet through her head, prison, hanging, and suicide. She's jealous that Peter confides in me and not her. She's offended that Dussel doesn't enter into her flir flirtations with him, as she's hoped, afraid that her husband is smoking all the fur coat money away. She quarrels, uses abusive language, cries, pity herself, laughs, and then starts a fresh quarrel again. What on earth can one do with such a foolish, blubbering specimen? No one takes her seriously. She hasn't any character, and she grumbles to everyone. The worst of it is that it makes Peter rude, Mr. Van Dan irritable, and Mummy cynical. Yes, it is a frightful situation. There's one golden rule to keep before you. Laugh about everything and don't bother yourself about the others. It sounds selfish, but it's honestly the only cure for anyone who has to seek consolation in himself. Crawler has received another call-up to go digging for four weeks. He's trying to get out of it with a doctor's certificate and a letter from the business. Kufis wants to have an operation on his stomach. All private telephones were cut off at 11 o'clock yesterday. Yours, Anne. Friday, 23rd of June, 1944. Dear Kitty, nothing special going on here. The English have begun their big attack on Cherbourg, according to Pym and Van Dan. We're sure to be free by October 10th. The Russians are taking part in the campaign, and yesterday began their offensive near Witzbuk. It's exactly three years to a day since the Germans attacked. We've hardly got any p potatoes. From now on, we're going to count them out for each person. Then everyone knows what he's getting. Yours, Anne. Tuesday, 27th of June, 1944. Dearest Kitty, the mood has changed. Everything's going wonderfully. Cherbourg, Witz and Sloban fell today. Lots of prisoners and booty. Now the English can land what they want. Now they've got a harbor. The whole Cotentin Peninsula, three weeks after the English invasion. A tremendous achievement. In the three weeks since D-Day, not a day has gone by without rain and gales, both here and in France. But a bit of bad luck didn't prevent the English and Americans from showing their enormous strength and how. Certainly, the wonder weapon is in full swing, but of what consequence are a few squibs apart from a bit of damage in England and pages full of it in the Bosch newspapers? For the matter, when they really realize in Boschland that the Bolshevists really are on the way, they'll get even more jittery. All German women not in military service are being evacuated to Groningen, Friesland, and Gelderland with their children. Mussert has announced that if they get as far as here with the invasion, he'll put on a uniform. Does that old fatty want to do some fighting? He could have done so in Russia before now. Some time ago, Finland turned down a peace offer. Now the negotiations have just been broken off again. They'll be sorry for it later, the silly fools. How far do you think we'll be on July 27th? Yours, Anne. Friday, 30th of June, 1944. Dear Kitty, bad weather, or bad weather at a stretch to the 13th of June. Isn't that well said? Oh yes, 
I have a smattering of English already. Just to show that I can, I'm reading An Ideal Husband with the aid of a dictionary. War going wonderfully. Babrowski, Mogilev, and Orsa have fallen. Lots of prisoners. Everything's all right here and tempers are improving. The super optimists are triumphing. Eli has changed her hairstyle. Meep has the week off. That's the latest news. Yours, Anne. Thursday, 6th of July, 1944. Dear Kitty, it strikes fear to my heart when Peter talks of later being a criminal or of gambling. Although it's meant as a joke, of course, it gives me the feeling that he's afraid of his own weaknesses. Again and again, I hear from both Margot and Peter, yes, if I was as strong and plucky as you are, if I always stuck to what I wanted, if I had such persistence, energy, yes, then. I wonder if it's really a good quality not to let myself be influenced. Is it really good to follow almost entirely my own conscience? Quite honestly, I can't imagine how anyone can say, I'm weak, and then remain so. After all, if you know it, why not fight against it? Why not try to train your character? The answer was, because it's so much easier not to. This reply rather discouraged me. Easy? Does that mean that a lazy, deceitful life is an easy one? Oh no, that can't be true. It mustn't be true. People can so easily be tempted by slackness and by money. I thought for a long time about the best answer to give Peter, how to get him to believe in himself and, above all, try to, to try and improve himself. I don't know whether my line of thought is right, though, or not. I've so often thought how lovely it would be to have someone's complete confidence, but now, now that I'm that far, I realize how difficult it is to think what the other person is thinking and then to find the right answer. More especially because the very ideas of easy and money are something entirely foreign and new to me. Peter is beginning to lean on me a bit, and that mustn't happen under any circumstances. A type like Peter finds it difficult to stand on his own feet, but it's even harder to stand on your own feet as a conscience living, living being. Because if you do, then it's twice as difficult to steer a right path through the sea of problems and still remain constant through it all. I'm just drifting around, have been searching for days, searching for a good argument against the terrible word easy, something to settle it all and once and for all. How can I make it clear to him that what appears easy and attractive will drag him down into the depths, depths where there is no comfort to be found, no friends, and no beauty, depths from which it is almost impossible to raise oneself? We all live, but we don't know the why or the wherefore. We all live with the object of being happy. Our lives are all different and yet the same. We three have been brought up in good circles. We have the chance to learn, the possibility of attaining something. We have all reason to hope for much happiness, but we must earn it for ourselves, and that is never easy. You must work and do good, not to not be lazy and gamble. If you wish to earn happiness, laziness may appear attractive, but work gives satisfaction. I can't understand people who don't like work, yet there isn't the case, yet that isn't the case with Peter. He just hasn't got a fixed goal to aim at, and he thinks he's too stupid and too inferior to achieve anything. Poor boy, he's never known what it feels like to make other people happy, and I can't teach him that either. He has no religion, scoffs at Jesus Christ, and swears, using the name of God. Although I'm not orthodox either, it hurts it hurts me every time I see how deserted, how scornful, and how poor he really is. People who have a religion should be glad, for not everyone has the gift of believing in heavenly things. You don't necessarily even have to be afraid of punishment after death. Purgatory, hell, and heaven are things that a lot of people can accept, but still, a religion, it doesn't matter which, keeps a person on the right path. It isn't the fear of God, but the upholding of one's own honor and conscience. How noble and good every one could be if, every evening before falling asleep, they were to recall to their minds the events of the whole day and consider exactly what has been good and bad. Then, without realizing it, you try to improve yourself at the start of each new day. Of course, you achieve quite a lot in the course of time. Anyone can do this. It costs nothing and is certainly very helpful.
Whoever doesn't know it must learn and find by experience that a quiet conscience makes one strong. Yours, Anne.